Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so, um, we are starting our uh, evening session on uh, Quantum Science Center Summer School. And uh, today, uh, I would like, uh, I'm happy to present our speaker, uh, Maria Mikhailova, uh, who is a senior software engineer from uh, Microsoft uh, Quantum Systems. And uh, today, uh, she is going to talk uh, about a uh, very interesting and important topic. Uh, she will uh, talk about introduction to C-Sharp and Microsoft Quantum Development Kit. So uh, it will consist of two parts. Uh, second uh, part uh, is of this lecture is going to be presented uh, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. by Matthias Tolkien. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so, Maria, we are happy to uh, have you here on our uh, summer school. And uh, please, uh, free to start whenever you're ready. And uh, yeah, just a reminder, during the presentation, uh, we have chats on both in Zoom and on our live stream YouTube channel, uh, where uh, people from audience can uh, type their question, and during the presentation, we will try to uh, answer this question. Um, okay, uh, Maria, now the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, and of course, for inviting me to speak here. Um, just one little housekeeping question before we begin the lecture in earnest. Uh, I, the way I, I'm set up, I don't see the chats, so I'm going to make little pauses between thoughts, and if there are any questions, I will appreciate if you read them out to me, okay? And I definitely encourage people to ask questions uh, during the presentation. I believe that helps to follow the thought. Okay, yeah. um, I think now we can start. Um, as was mentioned before, my name is Maria Mikhailova. I'm a senior software engineer at Microsoft Quantum Systems team, uh, focusing on education and outreach. I do things such as figuring out ways to help people learn quantum computing and, of course, the quantum development kit at QSharp and to make this learning mm, interesting and engaging. I hope to succeed in this goal today. Um, let's take a quick look at what we are going to cover in today's session and which parts are going to be delegated to part two tomorrow. Uh, we'll start by uh, getting a little overview of Microsoft Quantum Development Kit and all the components that are part of it. Then we will spend some time on expressing basic concepts of quantum computing in q -sharp. There are some nuances which can be a little in evident. Next, we will see a couple of ways to run q -sharp programs as standalone q -sharp and as q -sharp Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, we will also discuss other ways that there are, but uh, we probably won't have time for a demo of those. Next, we will cover the tools for visualization and debugging of q -sharp programs. That is a really important part of working with a new quantum programming language, being able to see what your program is doing and what went wrong in it. And then hopefully we will have a little time to spend on more advanced elements of QSharp as a language, both quantum specific elements and um, things that are more functional elements of a programming language. And finally, I will point you to some great learning resources. Um, okay. I will turn on my camera. I have this habit of pacing during the talks. It's kind of hard to <laughs> give a two hour long talk while sitting still. And I um, don't want to give anybody motion sickness. So, Microsoft Quantum Development Kit is a collection of uh, tools to help you develop quantum programs and integrate them with classical code for this end-to-end um, -end, uh, 
hybrid workflows that we know is necessary for implementing most quantum algorithms in which a quantum program is only a part of the workflow, not all of it. And classical code and quantum code do the parts that they are best suited for doing. Uh, quantum Development Kit is open source, cross-platform. You can use it on Windows, on Mac, on Linux. I'm mostly using it on Windows and on Linux, but I've heard good things about Mac as well. Uh, you can get Quantum Development Kit at this link, which is going to give you a lot of options to install it. So what are the main components of Quantum Development Kit? Uh, First, the core one is Q-sharp. Uh, Q-sharp is the main specific language for expressing quantum algorithms. It is, uh, as we're going to see later today, uh, somewhat similar to some classical languages. It, it, it resembles C-sharp, F-sharp to some extent to some people, um, but it is pretty unique. And we will talk about the logic of why we wanted to develop a domain-specific language rather than implementing it as a library for F# -sharp or for Python um, a bit later today. Next, uh, it is a unique language, so it needs its development tools to make sure that working with it is as smooth and convenient as working with other uh, languages, existing ones. So you can use familiar tools such as Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, uh, Jupyter Notebooks to develop and run your sharp code. We are going to see a lot of this today. I'm going to have just a few slides in the beginning and then it's going to be all demos. Uh, next, there is a variety of tools used to uh, facilitate the parts of uh, quantum software development that happen locally on your machine. These include uh, simulators, resource estimators, well, different flavors of simulators. Um, of course, we have the full state simulator, which uh, simulates the full behavior of a quantum program, good for only small uh, instances. So Basically, anything above 40 qubits is not simulatable using it, but it's really useful for things such as learning and uh, writing unit tests. There are some specialized simulators, such as Toffoli simulator. Mm, I'm sure most of you have at least some idea about reversible computing, implementing classical computations on a quantum computer. So Toffoli Simulator is very useful for doing these implementations and uh, again, writing unit tests for them. And resource estimators allow us to figure out the cost of executing this program on a quantum device, things such as the number of qubits, the uh, depth of the program, the number of different types of gates that go into it. So basically all the information you need to evaluate your program and on one hand to figure out whether it is going to run on hardware or not. And on the other hand, to possibly work on optimizing your algorithm even before it hits the hardware. You can do plenty of algorithms research and optimization using just resource estimation and unit tests. Uh, next, there are libraries. Uh, q -sharp has several types of libraries. One um, kind of big group is libraries that help you write um, high-level code. So if you're writing a classical program, uh, and you want to add two numbers. Chances are that you're not going to think about you know, how they are represented in memory, whether they're little-endian or big-endian. 
how exactly to perform addition bit by bit, right? You just want to write C equal A plus B and be done with it and move on to something more interesting like your algorithm itself. And the same applies here. We want to help people write high level code, which means we want to have a lot of libraries that do boring things, kind of well-defined things for you so that you don't need to re-implement them from scratch, such as quantum Fourier transform, modular arithmetic, all those kinds of nice things. And second group of uh, libraries are domain specific libraries. For example, we have a, a chemistry library that we are using for evaluating uh, quantum chemistry algorithms. As there is an experimental machine learning library that follows one of the papers one of our folks wrote, those kinds of things. You're going to hear a lot more both about the simulators and about the libraries tomorrow from uh, Matthias in part two of this talk. Uh, next, of course, there is Azure Quantum, which you have already heard about yesterday from Stefan. Once you have developed your program locally and ran the tests on small instances and made sure that you know that, that you believe that it's a correct program and you ran resource estimation in it and convinced yourself that it is going to run on hardware, the next step is to go to Azure Quantum and run the same program on hardware. And I believe Stefan did quite a detailed demo of that part of the workflow, so I'm not going to be touching on that today. And finally, we have some really nice learning materials, including uh, programming tutorials called Quantum Katas, a collection of programming exercises that help you learn by doing. I will give you a quick demo of those if we have time in the end. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, it seems like there are no questions, uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, we can continue. Yeah. Next, so a very common question that we are asked is uh, why Keysharp? Why did we feel the need to create a completely new language? Why? didn't we just do an extension of a different language, a library? Well, there are um, several reasons. Most of, um, most of all, we wanted to create a language that is um, targeted specifically for quantum application development and nothing else. On one hand, we want it to have a lot of built-in functionality, such as quantum data types, some concepts that are commonly used in quantum computing. Uh, again, we are going to see more of this later today, but this is something that you probably can do with a library. You can introduce a qubits data type and do some things with it, so that's probably possible. We also want to have our compiler have capabilities that stem from it understanding the code very well. So, for example, if we want to have an operation and to generate uh, a joint and controlled variance of that operation automatically, we need to have a very good idea of the, what this operation is doing. We don't want it to have too complicated classical computations. We don't want it to do uh, things like changing the values of the variables in an uncontrolled manner. We don't want side effects of operations. There are lots of things that we tried out and we figured out that 
the right level of understanding the language only comes with the language itself. Uh, third, we want our programs to run on quantum computers. Okay, that's kind of trivial, right? If we're <laughs> developing quantum applications, we want them to run on quantum computers. But we also want to keep them high level. So on one hand, we want to we want our compiler to be able to understand the programs and to do a lot of transformations with them. For example, we want to write our g -sharp program once and we want it to run everywhere on a simulator, on resource estimator, on different types of hardware with different underlying architectures so that if we have multiple hardware providers in Azure Quantum, for example, which are using different architecture of their hardware, we want to still be able to use the same q -sharp program on both of them. And we want to make compiler do the dirty work for us to take this high-level program and to target it for different hardware or for the simulator. We're also using the domain specificness of our language to restrict what it can do. For example, we don't want our quantum code to do things like request input from the user or go to a database, read something, or go to the internet and fetch some data. Because all those operations are slow compared to the lifetime of quantum programs. If you make a pause in the middle of it and you ask user for some input, by the time the user entered this data, uh, chances are that the state of your quantum program will have deteriorated to the point that you need to start again. So we have the main specific language, which just doesn't offer these opportunities to the user. If you need any data, you pass it to the quantum program beforehand. So uh, the model of using quantum computer as an accelerator is the separation of the things that classical computer can do really nicely, such as interacting with the user or accessing database, or for example, pre-processing to get the structure of the molecular before feeding it into the quantum program. The kinds of things that quantum, the classical computers are good at and quantum not so good. And the quantum computers are used only to solve the very specific problem with very specific inputs that they are well suited for solving, such as modeling the molecular that they are given. Okay, um, I think that's most of the reasons why we figured out we want to have our own language. Uh, things like integrating it with editor, with common editors is just a matter of convenience and interoperability with classical languages is a matter of necessity, as I just described in our hybrid workflow model. Um, any questions so far? Uh, actually, uh, there are no questions from audience, but I have a question. Uh, of so, course. Uh, for which uh, systems, uh, among existing systems, uh, uh, you want to use uh, the code first? Uh, because currently, like, there is a problem with uh, uh, high-performance hardware, quantum hardware. Uh, so, but uh, what uh, seems to you the most uh, closest uh, to such realization? Mm, sorry, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. So we are partnering with uh, IonQ and Honeywell right now. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, this is a question like uh, which hardware uh, uh, you're using uh, for simulations? Yeah. 
Yeah, so right now we are using uh, INQ and Honeywell. Um, I'm trying to remember what is their architecture. Uh, yes, I think they're both striped ions. But frankly, I <laughs> don't work with the hardware directly, so I only remember what I read in the documentation for them. Yeah. But then, mm -hmm. uh, kind of, our view here is kind of the long term view. Like, I work with uh, applications and education mostly, so. Uh, I'm really taking advantage of the fact that Q-Sharp is hardware agnostic. I can develop programs without any awareness of what hardware is going to run upon. Because if we change the architecture, if we add another partner, or if we add Microsoft hardware, which uses different physical principles, I'm not going to even notice because I work with high-level language. Very convenient for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, let's take a look at some of the basic concepts of quantum computing and the way they are expressed in Q-sharp. Uh, the most fundamental concept of quantum computing is, of course, qubit. In Q-sharp, qubit is a built-in data type, which is uh, somewhat similar to objects in classical object-oriented software. The qubits have uh, this uh, internal state that is a joint state of the whole system but it is hidden. You're not going to be able to see it directly. Instead, you're going to access this state by getters measurements, and you're going to modify this statement by other methods, um, gates. This can be a little counterintuitive at the start. I've seen a lot of people who are just starting to learn quantum computing with Q-sharp, do things like try and assign a state of the qubit directly to the qubit or to uh, to do something that they expect will give them a state but it won't. Now, but if you think about it, this is the physical uh, the way the physics of the system works. You cannot see the state of a physical qubit directly. You cannot make the decisions on the state of that qubit without measuring it in the physical system. So Q-sharp doesn't allow you to do this. Q-sharp only allows you to do things that are physical. But uh, at the same time, we want to try and be nice to our users because following the physical system principles is great, but if you have a bug somewhere and you're not hitting the hardware yet, if you're just learning or you're just debugging your program on a small instance, you want some help. You want to be able to figure out what went wrong there. Uh, so we are doing a little cheating. If you were running on a simulator, you can use some capabilities such as the machine that help you see the quantum state. You still cannot make decisions based on what you saw there because it will only write the state out for you. It will not allow you programmatic access to it. And this turns out to be extremely helpful, especially when learning, of course. While not giving you any bad habits such as making decisions based on the amplitude of the zero state. Uh, Maria, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, there was a question uh, mm -hmm. in Q&A. So the question is from Akbar Surani, uh, the amplitude of one will be zero plus one i, right? Uh, I think the slide shows it as uh, zero plus zero i. Um, okay, let's see, on the slide we are allocating a qubit. 
uh, when you allocate qubits in Q-sharp, they start in the zero state. And we print the state of this qubit immediately. We are running on simulators, so we can do this. And dump machine gives us the amplitudes of two states, zero and one. The amplitude of zero state is one, and this amplitude of one state is zero. So since we are starting in the zero state, the amplitude of zero is going to be one. Okay? Mm -hmm. We will see changing amplitudes on the next slide. And this is a snippet from how it, from what it looks like to run the Q -sharp code in Q -sharp notebooks. You define the cell which defines an operation and then you use another cell in which you do something with that operation. In this case, you simulate it, but you can also do some other interesting things to it. We will see more of those later today. Okay, next fundamental thing, uh, quantum computing concept are the quantum gates, of course. And again, Q-sharp representation of them matches the, uh, their physical logic. <laughs> gates are operations on qubits which don't have an output, but they have a side effect of changing the internal state of those qubits on which they are acting. Uh, again, I see really often people trying to bring the mathematical notation of the gate into Q sharp code. So for example, in math, you would be writing things such as Hadamard gate applied to cat zero it is cat plus. So people try to apply Hadamard gate to a qubit and assign its state to another qubit. Uh, there is a lot of space to do something interesting here, but that's not what it looks like. So it looks like just applying an operation to a qubit and it has no return. But if you do dump machine after the gate is applied, you're going to see that the states changed. In this example, we are adding the Hadamard gate before the dump machine. And we all know that the Hadamard gate converts zero state to zero plus one state. And this is what we see. The amplitudes of two basis states are equal. And both of them one over square root of two. Quantum gates can have parameters, uh, classical parameters beyond the quantum um, the qubits. And again, uh, here we want to be nice and to help you debug your programs. So we have a nice operation called dump operation, which allows you to see a gate as its matrix representation. I will show you it, uh, one of these once we get to the demo. We also have a library operation that allows you to uh, apply a gate with the given matrix. So you don't necessarily have to do the uh, gate uh, synthesis yourself, decomposing it into the primitive built-in gates, but you can use that library. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, we don't have questions uh, now. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, next concept is measurements. Measurements are another kind of operations in qubits. They also have a side effect of changing the internal state of the system, uh, collapsing the superposition into the state that corresponds to the measurement result. But it does have uh, a return value. If you perform a measurement, it returns you the measurement result, zero or one. The return value is a special data type result. 
uh, we experimented some with keeping it an integer or a boolean but then we figured that it's better to keep it separate and to allow the user the programmer to convert it to whatever they want otherwise it's just too easy to confuse it with something so we have result data type which is uh, an enum effectively with two values zero or one and if you want to get it into a boolean you just convert your value you compare your value of result with constant zero or with constant one and here in the demo we see that we allocate the qubit we apply the Hadamard gate to it and then we measure it we print the measurement result and we do dump machine afterwards so here our measurement gave us state one and you see the dump machine output matches it we have a non-zero amplitude of this basis state one sounds good mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. And uh, one of the last slides, a slightly more sophisticated example, random number generation, which gives you a peek at some more uh, language constructs in q -sharp. We're going to spend a lot more time on those. Uh, but at a glance, uh, in the first two lines, we see that q -sharp, um, treats mutable and immutable variables differently and bits is an immutable variable effectively a constant so it's defined using the let keyword and it doesn't change throughout the program uh, count once is a mutable variable we are going to run our random number generator multiple times and to count the number of ones uh, that got generated so we define it using mutable keyword and later when we want to update it we use set keyword to update the value this difference between mutable and immutable variables allows us to simplify things such as a joint generation if you want to generate an adjoint variant of the operation you want to basically reverse everything that happened in it and if you have any mutable variables in it it's going to be very tricky so q sharp doesn't allow you to generate a joint if there are any mutable variables inside but if you need some variables that don't need to be mutable you can just define immutable variable and it will not harm your adjoint generation in any way next uh, for loops and if then else constructs look very much the same like in normal languages you iterate over the range of values and for each of them you apply Hadamard gate measure the outcome update the variable we are going to see more interesting constructs later today including some quantum specific ones these ones so far were purely classical uh, any questions well, so far? Yeah, there is a one question mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Graeme Jacobson. Uh, I probably just missed you saying this, but let uh, is what is used for immutable variables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let is for immutable. Basically, defining a constant mutable is what's used for immutable variables. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we are done with the basics and we can move on to something more interesting. Okay, let's see a slightly more complicated example a Deutsch Jose algorithm implemented in Q Sharp. Uh, kind of in the wild what the development environment looks like what are the capabilities that it offers 
what are some of the more interesting structure that are used, uh, those kinds of things. Um, I didn't really feel like typing the whole Deutsche Jaws algorithm from scratch. So I have my pre-written code and uh, to get things a little interesting right up front, it has some bugs in it. So this is the first thing you can see, the compilation me uh, error messages. And of course, before we are going to run this, algori this algorithm, we are going to fix those errors. Uh, here I'm using Visual Studio. Uh, as my development environment, you can also use Visual Studio Code. I use that one on Linux, but I'm on Windows now. You see that it offers um, the kind of obvious default things such as syntax highlight and uh, IntelliSense, for example, giving, like, explaining what the error here is and underlining where it comes from. It seems kind of uh, something that you would assume by default for a language, but I still remember the times where Q Sharp was not colorized and did not offer those IntelliSense features, so I appreciate them. Um, let's see what are our bugs here. Okay, we can start with the simplest one. No identifier with the name exists. It's a perfectly classical thing. If you want to use a library operation, and this is a library operation, you need to open a namespace for it. So what we are going to do, we are going to use a code action which offers to do just that for us. Very convenient, spares me some typing. This subtly suggests us to look into the way the code is organized. In q -sharp, all code has to be part of namespaces. Here's the namespace is called the Shows algorithm. Uh, this is similar to C Sharp. You cannot have Q Sharp code outside of a namespace. The first thing that goes in the namespace are namespace open directives. Whenever you use a library or whenever you use something from a different project that is not part of the QDK but is part of your code base, you need to open the corresponding namespace. Here we are opening three of them, one for measurement utilities, um, intrinsic is the gates that are built in, such as Hadamard gates or poly gates, and Canon is um, kind of a, a catch-all namespace that contains a lot of useful functionalities that is hard to place in a more specialized namespace. We're going to see it all over the place. Uh, I think there is a question. Yes, you're right. Uh, after measuring the qubit, uh, can be the value of zero, 01 or true false? Uh, when we measure the qubit, our result is going to be zero or one. Uh, they are not integers zero or one, but they are result data type. Actually, I think I have it a bit later here. Yeah, mm -hmm. so here, um, what this code snippet does, multi-m measures each qubit uh, in the array and returns an array of measurement results. So then when we iterate over this array, we compare each result to zero. And you can see is the IntelliSense here. Also, the letters are a little small. Those are not really configurable. So it says zero is a built-in result literal, result of a measurement that projected the state on the plus one against space. There is also a one literal, which corresponds to minus one. Uh, eigenvalue, eigenspace. So 
we have this measurement result type just to keep it separate from integers because we, do, we don't want to, for example, add two measurement results. If we want to add them, we want to first convert them to some numeric values and then to be adding them. So this helps us keep our code logically clean. Sounds good? Uh, yeah, and uh, maybe a question from me. Uh, so mm -hmm. is it possible to introduce some noise in uh, measurements? Uh, um, I mean, in mm -hmm. principle, Q Sharp uh, allows us to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are ways to do this. Um, probably the easiest way is to keep your code logical without noise and to change your simulator. q -sharp has several built-in simulators, not the open system simulator yet. We uh, are working on it. But you can develop your own simulator that either um, kind of does everything from scratch and introduces noise kind of wherever you want it to. Or you can use an existing simulator such as full state simulator and then modif mm, redefine, for example, the measurement operation that allows you to introduce noise only in the measurement. Like you would have perfect gates and measurements that is incorrect with some probability. Um, it is a little bit out of scope for today. Uh, I can ask Matthias to talk more about it tomorrow or I can try and find I know I did a simulator like this. But it was over a year ago. So let me see if I can find it. So this is the repository with uh, our samples. Yeah, I think it's. Yes, exactly. So this is our samples repository, github.com, Microsoft slash quantum. And we have samples for runtime. So basically for implementing your own uh, simulators or extending the simulators. And this one, simulators with overrides, is a simulator that uses full state simulation and redefines only the measurement. If you want to look inside really quickly, I won't spend too much on this. You see that this simulator extends quantum simulator, which is our full state one. And then it redefines just the measurement, the measurements in, in Q-sharp are operation M, to do something like this. It defines an operation that with some probability introduces an X error and then performs perfect measurement. You can kind of play okay, with it to define other things. Mm -hmm. But this is only in uh, this part of the code. Uh, so far, q -sharp doesn't have this uh, in build possibility to do this. No, it's not built in yet. We are hoping okay. to mm -hmm. include it soon, but not at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so far we talked about namespaces, right? Okay, uh, let's probably just go top to bottom here and see what interesting things we can find here. So this is the way an operation is defined in Q-sharp. Uh, this is a phase oracle that implements a constant function, f of x equals zero. We probably all know if you want to implement a phase oracle for f of x equals zero, you don't need to do anything. Very easy to implement. Since it's a phase oracle, it takes one input, the register of qubits. 
uh, an array of qubits. Uh, this um, semicolon unit is the description of the return value of this oracle since it's a quantum gate effectively it doesn't have any return value so unit is a nothing type its side effect would be the changing the state of the qubits if we wanted to do this we don't want to do this so there is operation the next one is a marking oracle, which implements a balanced function, the value of k is bit. And this one is getting more interesting. First, since it's a marking oracle, we want to apply it to a register of qubits that is an input and a target qubit. We don't want to put them together into a single array because why would we need to do this if they're logically different? and it takes an integer parameter. The number of the cube, the index of the qubit, uh, which we need to take. And um, we know that if the value of x is equal to one qubit, we need to do a controlled knot with z qubit as the control and the target as the target. Uh, here we are using a very convenient uh, built-in tool in q a controlled functor. What it does is it takes the gate or another operation, in this case the x gate, and defines its control variant. The parameters of this controlled variant are going to be the array of control qubits, which can be empty, one qubit or multiple qubits, and the parameters of the original operation. In this case, we want to control on a single qubit and uh, use our target qubit as a control. And here we see another example of what IntelliSense tells us when we have a type mismatch. It says that our actual type is qubit and the expected type is array of qubits. So the control functor makes the first parameter an array. It requires the first parameter to be an array. So if we define a single element array here, instead of just a single qubit, the error goes, goes away. Uh, so far, so good? Yeah, uh, we don't have any questions. Mm -hmm. Good. Next is a more interesting operation, which implements our phase kickback trick. I just love those JAWS algorithm. It allows to show so many language structures. It's just surprising. So here, in our phase kickback trick, what we are trying to do, we want to take a marking oracle and apply it to a register of qubits as a phase oracle. So we are converting a marking oracle to a phase oracle and applying it immediately. To do this, we take two parameters. One of them is, of course, the register to which we want to apply this phase oracle. And the other one is the marking oracle. Now, q has elements of uh, functional programming in it. And this is the most prominent of them. It can use uh, operations and functions as first-class citizens effectively, uh, assigning them to variables, passing them around as parameters, and generally making, um, developing generic code uh, really convenient. Uh, the signature of this marking oracle reads as follows. This is an operation. This kind of an arrow means it's an operation. If it was a function, it would have been that kind of arrow, different one. This is an operation which takes two parameters, an array of qubits and a qubit, and has no return. That's it. That's our marking oracle parameter. Inside our phase kickback operation, what we are going to do? Allocate an extra qubit, which we're going to use as our minus state 
to perform the actual phase kickback. Next, we are going to prepare this allocated qubit in the minus state, because that's what we need for phase kickback. Next, we are going to apply the marking oracle. Our target is in the minus state, so it's going to be the same as if we applied the phase oracle to this register. And it's not going to change the state of our target. Then we want to release our helper qubit and return from separation. But at this point, our helper qubit is going to be in the minus state. Q sharp uh, has a thing about keeping track of uh, qubits that you allocated and deallocated and their states. Uh, what we want you to do is to make sure that before you release qubits, you measure them or you uncompute them. If you are trying to release a qubit that you haven't measured and you haven't uncomputed, so it's not in the zero state. Well, if you're doing it on hardware, we can't really help you because we won't know what's the state of this qubit. But if you're doing it on a simulator, uh, the simulator has an option to keep track of the state in which the released qubits are. And if you don't measure or uncompute your qubit, before releasing it, you're going to get uh, released qubits are not in zero state error. Why do we want to do this? Uh, we want um, to be really mindful of what's happening to those qubits. Uh, if you're trying to release uh, qubits that are still entangled with others, it's going to be a little similar to the troubles in which you can get with classical mem memory management and garbage collection, but it's going to be different and very quantum interesting. So if you release qubits and they are still entangled with other parts of your system, what are the options of what uh, the compiler can do for you? It can do nothing with them and then allow you to reuse them. Uh, our quantum hardware is going to be not very big for quite a long time. So we don't have the luxury of using qubits only once. We're going to reuse them, such as this helper qubit. We cannot allocate a fresh qubit every time we want to do phase kickback. We will run out of qubits really soon. Uh, if the qubits that are still entangled with part of the system are allocated again as if they were fresh then another part of your program is going to do something interesting to them and eventually it will either measure them which will change the state of the part of the system that was entangled with them quite unexpectedly for you or it's going to just get incorrect results by using those qubits and we don't want the compiler to measure them on your behalf as well. Because again, this is going to collapse the state of the system that is entangled with those qubits. So again, a nice hard to track down bug. So this is why we have this option to keep track and warn you if your qubits are released in non-zero state. And this is why we want you to run your program locally on the simulation before you go and hit the hardware. Things are a lot harder to debug on hardware and really, really easy to debug locally. Well, easy in comparison, I guess. You just get all those lovely tools and helpers that help you with this that you don't get when you're running on hardware. So. This was a bit of a detour, but the point is we want to make sure that qubits released are measured or in zero state. We don't want to measure this target qubit, so we uncompute it, return it to the zero state using gates. And here it's really easy because we know what the state was 
and then computing a minus state is really easy. The next construct of interest here is this within apply construct. It serves to support this pattern of uncomputation that is extremely common in quantum computing, in which you first do some computation to prepare, then you do some computation to read out the results, and then you have to undo this first part of computation, apply it's a joint. So within apply, automatically applies a joint of this within block after apply block is performed. This is again convenient from software development point of view. You could do it by hand, right? Generating a joint of something by hand is possible. But if you write two very similar blocks of code, one of them is direct, one of them is a joint, and then you decide that you want to modify one of them, chances are that one of these times you're going to forget to modify the second one to do a matching change. So again, interesting hard to track bugs. And anyways, why do double the work if we can have the compiler do this? Not exciting part of work of generating a joint for us. For us. Um, any questions so far? Uh, no, I don't see any questions. Good, thank you. We are done with face kickback. What is our next thing? Our next thing is the just algorithm itself. Uh, it takes two parameters, the number of qubits that is an integer and a phase oracle. This again, phase oracle is an operation and we have seen the syntax for that already. So we can easily read that this is an operation that takes an array of qubits and returns nothing. And this operation, unlike the previous one, has a return value, a boolean. Since uh, it's not a gate, it's an algorithm and we want it to return us something. Inside this algorithm, uh, the things that we do. First, we define a variable to hold our result. We are going to make some decisions about it based on our measurements. So it's immutable. Next, we allocate an array of qubits, uh, as many qubits as our phase oracle requires. Next, um, you're probably all familiar, familiar with Deutsch Jaws algorithm. We apply a bunch of Hadamards, apply the phase oracle, apply Hadamards again. Uh, this apply to each is a library operation and IntelliSense is going to tell you. It's an operation from a Microsoft Quantum, Quantum Canon namespace that applies a single qubit operation to each element in the register. And uh, here we get another error here. The Operation called doesn't support the necessary functors. Um, so we just learned that within applies the direct computation and then after the apply block applies a joint of that computation, which means it needs to be able to generate that adjoint automatically. Uh, how does Q -sharp compiler generate this adjoint? Uh, it takes the operations inside this operation, reverses their order, so goes from bottom up, and for each of those operations, applies its adjoint variant. In particular, this means that everything you use inside uh, an operation that you need to calculate an adjoint of has to have an adjoint of its own. If it's gates, it really, it's really easy because all built-in gates have a joints. If it's measurements, not really possible. So you cannot do measurements inside uh, 
automatically a jointable operation. Uh, here, this error means that you are trying to calculate an adjoint of an operation, but apply to each doesn't have an adjoint specified. Even so, we all understand that applying Hadamard's to qubits is adjointable. This particular library operation doesn't have a joint specified for it. How to fix this error? Well, there is another operation that is exactly similar to this one in all aspects, but it does have an adjoint defined for it. And the error goes away just like this. Generally speaking, it is possible to um, evolve the language to the point at which it's going to start understanding that if you want to do apply to each and the thing that you are applying has a joint, then apply to each also is going to have an adjoint. We do have this at some in our plans at some point in the future, but right now we have to have those separate operations depending on whether our inside operation is a jointable, controllable, both or neither. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, I don't see any questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, then the second part of the algorithm Again, we all know, measure all qubits if any of the results is one, it's not going to be constant. And here is another kind of error. This one IntelliSense is not going to help you with. It's a logical error. So <laughs> this one you're going to notice only when we run the algorithm and see incorrect result. So we know that for Deutsch just algorithm, if all our results are zero, it's constant. If at least one of them is one, it's not constant. So here we actually need one instead of zero. And it's our other built-in result literal. And then once we're done with the measurements and variable assignments, we return this mutable variable. One thing to note here is we want to, depending on how we implement our loop, we don't want to leave part of our qubits unmeasured and return from the middle of the loop. So here we are doing our measurements completely. Then we're doing our for loop completely and only then we return our uh, result. Okay, we are getting closer to the end of the code and to actually running it to make sure that I'm not deceiving you and that it actually runs. This tiny helper function here, they convert the Boolean value into a string, constant or balanced. This syntax here is our ternary condition expression, uh, similar to languages like C++. Uh, Python's one looks different, but the logic's the same. So if the value is true, we return constant, otherwise we return balanced. And finally, our main operation that puts together all the pieces we just implemented and runs algorithm on a specific oracle. Um, okay. The operation we are running doesn't have any, par any inputs and any outputs. It's also annotated with this entry point attribute, which tells the compiler that this is standalone Q sharp program. It does, it's not going to have a classical program as a host. And it, um, so when the program is executed, this operation 
is the entry point. You need to start with execution from this operation. Now we are going to call our algorithm twice. One for the constant function. Our constant function was defined as phase oracle, so it was really easy. We pass the operation with the right signature to is function constant. We get our result back. We print the result. Uh, this uh, string uses string in string interpolation, uh, very similar to C sharp. And again, Python has something similar in it. If you put a dollar before the string, it's going to treat this kind of uh, squiggly brackets as uh, substituting the expression inside them for its value. And next, we do something similar for the balanced function. But our balanced function was defined as a marking oracle. So we are going to have a little fun with our face kickback operation and with another uh, Keysharp feature, partial application. This um, underscore here is partial application. And how does it work? We saw that marking Oracle case bit takes three parameters, two qubit parameters and an integer. We want right now to define another operation that takes two of those qubit parameters, the qubit array and the qubit, but doesn't take an integer parameter, but rather assumes that this integer parameter equals two. So this is what we do. We substitute the parameters that we know at this point with an integer and leave the other two unbound to define a new operation that has fewer parameters. So this, this highlighted piece of code means that this is a marking oracle for um, second bit. And then, just to keep things interesting, we are going to use partial application again, immediately. Uh, again, our phase kickback operation, apply marking oracle as phase oracle, took two parameters, one of them marking oracle, and another of them input register. If we pass the marking oracle, but don't pass input register, and use this underscore for input register, this is going to be a phase oracle that is implemented by means of applying phase kickback trick to this marking oracle. And then this operation is going to have this very short signature array of qubits with no return. Because this is what this apply marking oracle as phase oracle becomes if you pass the value for the first parameter, but not for the second one. After this, the thing gets much easier. We have our phase oracle defined, so we pass it to the is function constant. And we get our result. Okay, I think there is another thing here, another logical one. Arrays in T sharp are zero based. It's been a while since I worked with a language that indexed its array elements starting with one. So this is the index and this is the number of qubits. So the index has to be strictly strictly smaller, otherwise we're going to get an array out of bounds bug. This is actually part of uh, programming assignments that I use when we talk about uh, debugging. It shows you a lot of bugs, but you have to be really careful what you are doing here, because otherwise you're going to get an error.
Okay. We are done with the code walkthrough. So now we can build the code and run it. Q sharp build success. And now we're going to get our outputs and magic. The, the zero function is classified as constant and the non-zero function is classified as balanced. So we did indeed find a sufficient number of bugs to have this code pass. Big success. Any questions so far? Uh, so indexes go through zero to uh, n minus one uh, mm -hmm. number of qubits. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same as in C plus plus, C sharp, Python. I did start my programming career with Pascal, which started indices with one, but it was a long time ago. Okay. So here. I, what we have seen so far, we have seen a lot of Q sharp constructs. Mm. Those are actually most of the things I wanted to show you in terms of constructs. We saw how to run a Q sharp project from Visual Studio. It's going to look very similar from Visual Studio code. You're just going to run it from command line probably. And now we are going to switch to Jupyter Notebooks and we are going to see the tools that we use for visualizing our quantum programs and the state of our programs and uh, running code in Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, this one we don't need. Okay, so Q-sharp Jupyter Notebooks are where most of the visualization happens. We do have some of these available in a command line as well, but they just don't look so pretty. So I'm using the prettiest version of this. Uh, this is what Q-sharp code looks like. Let me make it a bit bigger, okay? Uh, this is what Q-sharp code looks like in uh, Q-sharp Jupyter Notebox. We have a dedicated kernel for compiling and running Q-sharp. So it's alongside with Python and other kernels. First of all, you see that there is no namespace here in the cell. We start the cell with opening namespaces. Uh, behind the scenes, Q Sharp compiler uh, takes those cells and wraps them into some service name namespace and compiles them this way. But we don't need to include them in the code cells. And uh, here again, we can define operations, multiple operations per cell, and then we're going to use simulate or other commands to run them. Let's execute this cell to see what happens. Well, pretty much what we expected. The result of this cell is basically the compiler reporting that I compiled this operation and this operation, but it's not running them yet. One piece of syntax that we haven't seen before is this um, suffix is arch plus ctl. It means that we want this operation to be a jointable and controllable, to have a joint and controlled variance. And we want Sharp compiler to take care of it for us, to generate things automatically. You see that this is a very simple operation. It's just a couple of gates and each of them has a joint and control. So it's uh, really easy for the compiler to do. It is Maria, uh, uh -huh. uh, Yeah, uh, sorry, we have a question uh, sure. from audience, uh, from uh, Graeme Jacobson. Uh, do you only uh, not need to identify a namespace in Jupyter or do you generally not have to do it? 
uh, it's only in Jupyter notebooks that we don't define it. As we have seen in the project, in the project we always have to define a namespace. Jupyter notebooks are kind of more lightweight, so they don't need the namespace. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. okay. So we have compiled the cell and we have our operations defined. So now we can uh, run one of them. We are going to use percent simulate magic command, which runs the operation on the full state simulator. Uh, when we were running the project, we didn't specify the simulator to use. So the compiler went with the default one, the full state simulator as well. In uh, Jupyter Notebook, you need to specify which one you are using, using the magic command. And this one is the command for full state simulator. And you see that our demo here is very quick, allocate the qubit, apply this gate, dump machine, and return the qubit to the zero state. Uh, our gate is Hadamard and then Y rotation, so both our amplitudes are real and uh, not equal. You see that dump machine has multiple fields here. It gives you the amplitudes, the measurement probabilities, both the visuals and the uh, percentages, and the phase uh, visual. It is possible to play with those parameters a little bit using percent config magic, which allows you to do things such as adding the number for the phase, removing measured probability, changing the presentation of basis state. It's a very useful magic, especially once you get to multi-qubit operations. The next thing I want to show you is dump operation. When we talked about uh, gates. We mentioned that this is something that allows us to see our operation as a matrix. This can be very convenient if you are trying to do some uh, unitary synthesis, implementing a specific operation, or if you want to implement a, ga a gate that has specific impact on one of the basis states just all around useful operation. We are doing it in a somewhat uh, roundabout manner. We define a wrapper for it that takes an array of qubits and applies the single qubit operation on it to the first of them. We are doing it this way because dump operation uses it takes two parameters. The first one is the number of qubits, and the second one is the operation. But this operation must take an array of qubits. So we cannot dump uh, single qubit operations as is without wrapping them this manner in this manner. We need to convert them to an operation that takes an array of qubits instead of a single qubit. But once we're done with this, we have this very nice representation. And actually, if we say our x here, just to keep our things a little complex, we can re then recompile this cell and then our cell is going to have those complex representations. Uh, this looks much nicer from visual, from uh, Jupyter Notebook than from Visual Studio or from command line. If you do it from command line, you get two separate matrices for real and for complex parts of the amplitudes. Here you get the combined version, much nicer. 
Uh, any questions so far? Uh, so um, maybe I have a question. Uh, so um, uh, why, like, uh, you switch to uh, Jupyter? Are there any uh, like big advantages of uh, Visual Studio or? Uh... Uh, the visuals in Jupyter notebooks are much nicer. Mm -hmm. So the dump machine looks nicer. It has those amplitudes this way. The unitary representation of the matrix. Uh, looks like a matrix rather than just a grid of numbers. And the next things I'm going to show you, the circuit visualization and the percent debug just don't have an equivalent in command line or in Visual Studio. So those, the things I'm going to show now are going to be unique for uh, notebooks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. So here we are going to see the same code on which we spent the past half an hour, and that's just algorithm. Uh, let's define all those operations. I'm not going to spend the time on the code itself. It's the same we have seen before, except it only runs for the marking oracle. I'm I omitted the constant function because it's not going to be interesting, and you will see what I want to do here. The next thing I'm going to show is percent trace. This is the command that allows you to visualize one program execution. By visualize, I mean build a circuit diagram of it, and I emphasize one run of the program because it doesn't analyze the structure of the program. If there are any gates that are applied conditionally, um, well, there's not really a way to show it in the diagram. If some of the things are a loop, there's no really a good way to show it in a diagram. So what we are doing, we are running the program once and just taking note of all gates that were executed. Um, okay, one more syntactic piece of sugar. You see that this algorithm takes a number of qubits as a parameter. And here we are passing this parameter to the percent trace command. So we don't need an extra wrapper that would be defining this number of qubits. Now let's see what our um, circuit diagram looks like. Uh, originally, it was not particularly interesting, just a big box. That's a really easy thing to draw. But then we can drill down into each of the boxes to the level of detail that we want. This uh, dynamic presentation allows us to combine the advantages of qubit level presentation and uh, the logical presentation of what were the things that we applied to get to this circuit level presentation. So our first box is applied to each A. And if we look into it, it is indeed applying to each qubit at Hadamard gate. A matching box for it is applied to each uh, A adjoint, and it's adjoint Hadamards. The last box, multi-M, performs a measurement on each qubit, which, so multi-M is a wrapper for, for each, and then for each actually does the measurements. And our biggest box, applying marking oracle as phase oracle, is going to have more layers inside it. So if we go into it, we have our preparation of the minus state, it's on preparation, and then the actual marking oracle. And then in the marking oracle, there is this C node that implements this marking oracle. So once we clicked on all boxes, we have something that looks really familiar to uh, a Deutsch Jose algorithm, probably something you have seen. But it also showed us the steps through which we went to get to this sequence of gates. If we had different code, 
even if it boiled down to the same gates, it would have a different box representation. This is actually a tool that one of our interns developed last year. Very helpful. Any questions so far? Uh, no, no questions. Good. Okay. The next tool I want to show you is another magic command, percent debug. I'm going to use the same algorithm here and see what it does for us. Okay, it, this should be enough for scale. So what it does, it, uh, go, it walks us through the algorithm and it shows us the parameters of the quantum state after each step. So if we do it step by step, uh, okay, let me see if I can, yeah, I will zoom out a little bit. There is not much text to see, but I want you to see the circuit diagram below it. So after we apply the first Hadamard gate, our uh, state probabilities are um, equal. So we go away from zero zero state to zero zero plus zero one state. You can also use this to match the qubit ordering to the order of bits in this cat state. You see that we applied the Hadamard state to the top line and that corresponded to last bit. So the lines top to bottom are written in cat state uh, right to left. Now we apply the next mm, Hadamard gate and we have equal superposition of all four states. After this, we allocate an extra qubit, but don't apply anything to each yet, to it yet. And then we apply the X gate. So all our probabilities go to the state in which this bottom wire, which corresponds to the first bit in this notation, are all in the one bit. Okay, here we want to switch to real and imaginary because here the probabilities view doesn't give us this, but the amplitudes view shows us that the amplitudes on, the amplitudes on half of the states are actually different. Uh, is there a question? Yeah, uh, there is a question from Remy Jacobson. Uh, does uh, debug disturb the state at all? Uh, is this runnable on hardware? This is runnable on simulation, so all these visualization tools run on simulation. So it doesn't disturb the state because it cheats. It peeks at the simulation and extracts the data from the simulation rather than doing the measurements the honest manner. Mm -hmm. So these, uh, these tools uh, are convenient in this uh, workflow in which you first work on your local machine. You work on a simulator, you run your program on small instances, you debug it on small instances. And only once you are kind of comfortable with what it does, only then you run on hardware. This allows you to save a lot of time waiting for your jobs in the queue and probably a fair amount of stress chasing your bugs on hardware because they're just easier to chase on a simulator. Okay, mm -hmm. after this... Um... Okay, after this we applied our marking oracle. So you see the amplitudes of uh, these two and these two change the sign after this, we finish this whole apply marking oracle as phase oracle block. And you see that the result of overall sequence was flipping the sign of these two amplitudes. 
and then we apply our Hadamard Hadamard. And as we expect for our balanced function, our all our probability is gathered here in the non zero zero state. So once we do our measurements, we will be done and we finish the debug session. This debug tool is actually a project by another of our interns past summer. So like a year ago, this part of the demo would have been much, much shorter and much less interesting. And the last piece in this notebook that I wanted to show you is the percent estimate magic. If we uh, run the percent estimate runs resource estimation on this program. Resource estimation doesn't simulate your program, unlike these uh, percent debug and percent trace tools. Instead, it goes through the program and only takes note of what gates you want to run. It doesn't actually execute them. So it's not going to give you a result. It's not going to uh, give you the ability to peek inside at the amplitudes. But what it does give you is the ability to estimate how uh, demanding your program is for the resources. So it gives you things such as the width of the circuit and the number of qubits that you're going to use in it. Yeah, actually, we can probably run it for n qubit equal to to match what we ran before. So we used three qubits and indeed two main qubits and one extra allocated for the minus state. We did two measurements, we did one C node and we did eight Clifford gates. And here you can see indeed eight gates. The advantage of this is that we can run it for programs that are not simulated. So if we increase the number of qubits to something that is not possible to simulate at all, it will still give us the estimates. And we are going to use this tool to figure out whether our program is ready to run on the hardware if we have access to several providers, which of, the, which of them can support this program and which cannot. And we can use this program, this tool, resource estimation to work on things such as algorithm optimization. For example, if we are working on uh, quantum arithmetic, implementing different arithmetic operations, on a quantum computer. We can combine the simulation for small instances uh, or Toffoli simulator to do larger instances. And we can to make sure that both our implementations are correct. And we can use resource estimation to compare the performance of our implementations once the inputs are larger. So we can combine our tools to both validate the programs on smaller instances and to evaluate them on instances so big that it's not feasible to simulate them. So we can figure out things like this implementation is going to be better under those circumstances and this implementation under those other circumstances. Any questions so far? Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, what is the upper limit uh, for number of qubits which can be simulated? Okay, for full state simulator running on my laptop, uh, 30 something mm, on a more powerful machine. 
probably something like 40. Anything above 40 requires very significant investment. We did experiment once to simulate 44, I think, or 46. And that required a whole Azure cluster taken offline and, and running this simulation alone. Uh, that was expensive. Uh, we don't do this usually. <laughs> so uh, the line for full state simulator is um, 40 qubits. Mm -hmm. For specialized okay. simulators, for example, Toffoli simulator, that's really easy to simulate, right? Each qubit is just one number, no entanglement, nothing as memory demanding as a complete quantum system. For that one, the default is uh, like 65,000 qubits, and you can amp it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Oddly enough, I got to the point at which I told you most of the things I was going to tell you. So let me show you the quantum cutters, our recommended way to practice Q sharp while practicing solving quantum computing problems. And then uh, you can think of any questions you have, and if I can answer them in the time remaining, I will. Sounds good? Yeah, yeah, uh, it sounds good, like a good plan. Mm -hmm. okay, so uh, the quantum cutters, tutorials and programming exercises for learning your sharp and quantum computing. This is my baby project. I'm the primary maintainer for it, so I feel strongly about it. But I also had good, heard good things about it, so it's not just my bias. So let's see what's the best way to show it. So this is a collection of tutorials and uh, so-called quantum cutters. Each tutorial covers the theory on one topic and offers programming exercises for it. Each quantum cutter offers only exercises. Okay, I have them here. So if you run them on uh, as Jupyter notebooks. Actually, if you want, you can follow along with this part of, this, of the tutorial. I am improvising here a little bit. Okay, so the link ak.ms slash try dash quantum dash cutters. Oops, this should go to everybody. Zoom is not being nice to me. Okay, so what you are going to see if you go to this link is something like this, the title page of the project. If you go to any one of them, you can see that they cover quite a lot of topics from the introductory quantum computing concepts, uh, just helping people ramp up on the complex arithmetic and the linear algebra that is necessary to start working with quantum computing. It walks through the concept of the qubit, what are the gates, how to represent multi-qubit systems, and it does all this with exercises. If you go to a kata, which does not have um, the theory in it, it only has exercises. 
it's going to look something like this. It gives you a little introduction and then it jumps right into the tasks. The tasks in each cotton uh, cover one topic. In this case, it's superposition kata, so it is state preparation. In this kata, the tasks look like this. You are given a qubit or several qubits in the zero state. Prepare a different state on them. Each cell after the task gives you the signature of the operation you need to implement. And it has this magic command that tells the compiler the name of the test to run. If we execute this cell, uh, control enter, it's going to compile this operation, but in addition, it's going to run this test. And this test checks that this was the state we wanted to prepare. And this was the actual state that we prepared. They are different, as you can see. So you're getting an error. The qubit is in an invalid state. Uh, try again. Uh, in the first task, we want to be like really nice to people. So what we are doing, we are literally telling them how to do this, how the syntax looks like in Keshap for this. So you can type what it asks you to type and you can execute this cell. And in this case, the state matches the other one and the test case passed. Big success. You can proceed to the next task. The next, ta the next task is a bit more complicated. It's preparing a minus state. So it's going to be two gates rather than just one. After this, we move on to multi-qubit states. Uh, first, unentangled states, then entangled states. After this, we take a look at complex phases. We look at uh, CNOT gate. We, we throw in things like conditional gate execution based on an integer parameter. We look at iterating over all qubits. So the tasks build up in complexity. And by the end of this tutorial, you're going to be doing things like preparing a W state on an arbitrary number of qubits, which is actually one of my favorite tasks in the whole quantum katas. Uh, and it requires quite some sophistication in the solution. It, it requires either recursion or some very careful manipulation of controlled gates and arbitrary rotations, or it can be used, it can be solved using post selection. That's a really beautiful task. It allows just so many uh, ways to solve it. And um, again, these tutorials are targeted at people who are starting to learn quantum computing. So they aim to offer as much help as possible. So one of the things we offer is the workbooks, the worked out solutions for the uh, tasks. So we don't just kind of throw people in the deep end of the pool and let them swim out. We offer them a very detailed worked out solution with the code. And then we show how to simplify it. And then we show a different post-selection solution, which is also very elegant, just uses different principles. So, and once we are done with the easier topics, we have more complicated things. We have measurements uh, tutorials. We go into simple algorithms a random number generation, teleportation, the standard things. We take a look at quantum oracles. This was one topic that was a massive obstacle for pretty much everybody I've met because there are lots and lots of materials on teleportation, but 
there are very few materials that take a really great job of explaining quantum oracles. I struggled with them myself a lot when I was learning this topic and everybody I met struggled at some point in their lives. We spent a section on grower search algorithm. That's another of my favorites. Have you ever noticed how many sources on grower search explain it as let's look for the 111 state? And it doesn't really convey the complexities of implementing the oracle for the uh, problems that you're trying to solve. So it simplifies it to the point at which this explanation becomes confusing. And then we have some more fun stuff here. Entanglement games, some protocols, some reversible computing, some quantum classification. So there, there is a lot of good stuff there. We got a lot of external contributions here. A lot of these katas are work of our students. Their final projects in the courses, for example, that kind of things. And uh, I heard really nice feedback about this project, so check it out. You can run it online if you use that link. Uh, try Quantum Katas; it brought you online. You can install KDK locally. The GitHub repository has installation instructions. Okay, that was all I have to say about the quantum colors. I mean, I can keep talking. <laughs> I've been working on this project for three years now, so I can safely keep talking for another hour, but let's keep it reasonable and open the floor to your questions. Uh, yeah, uh, we don't have questions so far here at least. Uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, I missed uh, some of the question from uh, uh, stream uh, in YouTube, but uh, it seems like uh, they're not relevant right now. So uh, maybe I have a question then. Um, so uh, is it um, this uh, platform compatible to uh, other languages? Uh, for example, there are some useful, useful libraries uh, for data science and machine learning. So is it possible somehow uh, to combine them? Mm, classical libraries or quantum libraries? Uh, classical libraries. Um, uh, yes, it is definitely possible to combine them. Um, actually, I have a tutorial that is not a tutorial about this, but it shows you how to do this. So this is a tutorial about quantum classification. But this, you can see here, it's a Python notebook. It's not a Q-sharp notebook. So the code here is going to be Python code. And mm -hmm. here you see we are importing Q-sharp and we are importing the Q-sharp namespaces to be used. And then, Okay, this is a machine learning example. So it does uh, data, prepar data preparation, data plotting, so far only classical. And then here it calls uh, classification. So quantum classification is actually Q-sharp code. Um, so you don't see Q-sharp code in here. You can see it if you go to the back end of the solution outside of Jupyter Notebook. And you run basically Q-sharp operation name dot simulate. You pass the parameters to it, you get the result out of it. This is a very simplified model of how you can integrate Q-sharp with, uh, for example, Python. You can do the same with .NET languages. But this uh, shows you this coprocessor model in which you do things in Python, such as visualization. You cannot plot this diagram in Q-sharp, it's just not suited for it, but you can do it in Python. And then you call Q-sharp to solve the specific things that 
you want the quantum computer to solve. Because after this, you can do something else to process your result afterwards. Uh, there is also a chemistry example I could show you real quick if I can recall how to do it, but it shows you the same principle. We have a host language which does something, possibly with some very heavy libraries, possibly with the main specific libraries like NWCAM or machine learning libraries or whatever tools you want. And then it calls quantum code with the parameters it has. And then it takes the results of quantum code and does something else with them. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, I don't see any other questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, please uh, type them. Uh, okay, so uh, it seems like uh, there are no questions. Yeah, uh, UEPI, uh, thank you, Maria, for the nice talk as well as nice collection of tutorials. Uh, so I joined this, uh, uh, thanks. And uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for giving this talk. It's a very uh, important topic uh, for future quantum computing. And uh, uh, we are looking forward to uh, here like the lectures uh, and future events uh, with uh, Quantum Science Center. Um, so uh, maybe uh, you can give uh, a brief introduction uh, what is going to be discussed tomorrow uh, in the second part of this. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, I, uh, I gave Matthias a lot of freedom in preparing his part of the talk but uh, he's going to talk about the libraries we have in a quantum development kit, about the simulators we have and uh, the workflow of validating the programs. So things at which I kind of hinted or alluded to saying, uh, like you work with the small instances locally and write unit tests today. I believe he's going to spend some time talking about that. He comes from a research background. His interests are in reversible computing largely and resource estimation. So he's much more knowledgeable about these topics than I am, and I believe this is what he's going to be talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yes, uh, okay, uh, so I think um, now, uh, uh, we can uh, finish our presentation and uh, thank you very much again for this uh, great, uh, great presentation. And tomorrow uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, we will continue our summer school with the second part uh, uh, of the talk which was given now. Uh, okay, uh, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Mm-hmm. <laughs>